It's uh, Benjamin Douglas Ray with another edition of Sustainable Cannabis TV. Today I have Tim Charles with me. How are you doing today? I'm real well. How are you today, Ben? Doing great. So this show is uh, brought to you by LinkedIn for Leaders Online, BuzzFeed, and Eight Saints brand, uh, organic hemp, Colorado high altitude products for joint pain, insomnia, and anxiety. So Tim is the founder and managing partner of BioCulture Group. So welcome. Tell us where you're coming from today. You know, thanks for the opportunity. I really appreciate the platform, Ben, the work you're doing on sustainability and um, in particular, the cannabis industry has really got my attention. I know a lot of other people are excited about it. So I'm real grateful to have the chance to be on the show today and share some of my thoughts and experiences. I made the decision to go back into venture, uh, venture effectively the third time as an entrepreneur uh, shortly after the farm bill passed. So it's been a wild 24 months thereabout since I founded Bioculture Group in February of 2019. Um, it's been a two year period now where one year doing a ton of advisory work effectively. Ohio, where I'm located, the Buckeye here in the Midwest, the governor signed the hemp bill in 2019. So it wasn't until 2020, just last year, that Ohio had the opportunity to be uh, in the game, if you will. So 2019, I worked in Utah, provided advisory services on a large 14,000 acre ranch. Certainly an eye-opening experience if you um, look at the scale of the project. So it's really been exciting. It's been a lot of challenging work, honestly, but I'm thrilled to be where I am and looking forward to the future. So what got you into the, the cannabis space in the first place? You know, I'm a middle-aged guy. I uh, was at Ohio State in the 90s. The canon, the California medical law um, became an opportunity while I was in school. I started an engineering college there and shortly after my freshman year, decided to pursue a horticulture degree. My background in agriculture, grandparents in farming. Um, I really enjoy plants. They seem to be uh, have their own challenges, just like people, but uh, <laughs> both are rewarding in their own way. So I'm um, passionate about plants and the opportunity being what it was in the 90s. I chose to stay in the Midwest and uh, effectively raise a family. And so now that the laws are continuing to develop here, it's becoming more of an opportunity. It's becoming more normalized. And the regulations being what they are, it, it became what I thought was um, normal and customary when the farm bill passed. Yeah. The previous president signed the language. I thought we'd be banking hemp businesses and on down the road. And it's been two years of a lot of developments slow and steady uh the the market has been challenging to say the least in the hemp industry with the price of the of the of the crop it's you know been a, a free fall from 50 dollars a pound down to the five dollar a pound range so you quickly need to know your cost of goods and be on top of it yeah you know i apologize tim my camera seems to be frozen so we'll just continue on and uh it may unfreeze here so you know, being here in Colorado, I, I kind of tend to think that the rest of the country, even though I know this is not true, is like, you know, how we are with the laws and how we refer to, you know, things as, as medical and rec. But I know it's, it's different in all states. And today I'd like to talk to you about really sustainability in kind of three different areas. Uh, one would be hemp, one would be adult use, as you call it out there, and then the third would be medical. So first, let's start with hemp and, and what's going on with sustainability as you see it there, kind of the past, present, and, and what's going on in the future in your prediction, and then really what you're working on around that. Yeah, thanks, Ben. It's um, There are effectively three markets, as I see it, and so the hemp um, market and the sustainability related to largely outdoor field agricultural production is similar in a lot of ways to the agricultural industry at large, where you have, um, you know, pesticide implications, you have soil erosion implications, you have this water sustain, you know, water management or limited use of water, uh, conservation of water. Um, so there are 
a lot of similarities there with the agriculture industry at large, but you're also talking about uh, the CBD, the cannabinoids, and effectively in a short amount of time, it looks like they'll be produced in the lab, not mm. in the field. And so there is the smokable hemp market, which I think is going to be there for a while. And I'm, I'm effectively in that market myself now in Ohio, and I know the soils are a, a big part of the quality of the product that you finish with. And so I've done a, a lot of soil testing all the way uh, back into the ornamental horticulture experience I had, but it's a different kind of a test when you know how rapidly the plant can accumulate these things. So the truth is finishing with a, a pesticide free organic crop that's gonna make a, a quality standards a challenging bit of work. And so as I see it, um, uh, the Midwest soils, a lot of automotive industry and a lot of um, coal industry uh, factories for the last 50, 100 years, a lot of the soils are effectively contaminated or have mm -hmm. impact to those type of industries. And you can also talk about the, the tobacco industry and some of the fungicides and the arsenic that is a byproduct of those, those crops. So it, it's... Each state is its own uh, challenge. Each type of soil represents its own unique set of challenges and opportunities. And so I just think it's a huge problem that has a, a lot of uh, opportunities. That's one of the reasons why I'm excited about it so much. It's it's gonna become a scaled industry, um, you know, multi-state operator kind of a, of a market, but there's gonna be opportunities for entrepreneurs at a much faster clip than some of the other industries we've been working to be successful in. You know, when you when you talk about the soil being damaged, how do you um, not have damaged soil from years and years of oil and chemicals? And, you know, what do you do about that? You know, I guess there's two questions there. How do you not get yourself into that predicament? And then how do you get yourself out of it? I think it, if you have good records and you've been managing your prop property, your farm, whether you're the farmer or you have a relationship with the farmer that's actually doing the work and you are actively managing the work, you'll have records. And some of this is just normal. You know where your inputs are coming from. So as the soils have been farmed, as the carbon has been basically removed in the conventional till and uh, maximize yearly returns, then the net effect has become you have to put more inputs into the soil. And so if your inputs are affected or contaminated with the heavy metals, you'll be bringing the contaminants in when you fertilize or put other uh, pesticides onto your crop. The, the alternative is if you live near a coal plant, you are effectively the recipient of potentially uh, EPA, you know, precipitates coming from the rain and and so there's a number of things that you are looking at when you decide where to farm and where you live, you know, uh, location matters. And so the opportunity is to remediate the soil with the cannabis fiber crop. Um, and that is one way that you can solve that problem in a, in a real timely manner. In a couple of years, two or three years, you're going to see a real difference in the, in the amount of contaminants that are in the soil. And after remediating the soil, then you can move on to that type of a medicinal crop or a, a higher grade product. So you're saying do your homework first. Like a lot of things we're learning in this business is the, the more planning you do, the more homework, the more testing, whatever it is up front, it's going to save you, you know, years and hundreds of thousands of dollars potentially in, in problems. Absolutely. It's a lot of common sense. It, it, none of this truthfully, is rocket science. It's a lot about knowing what to do, when to do it, and having the funds to do it. And so there are a lot of challenged hemp farmers right now because the um, banks are not lending to the hemp industry. The SBA is not lending to the hemp industry. So I, I post oftentimes about access to capital because the truth is, if you want jobs to be created, let the American citizens uh, let the free markets be what they are, and you'll see jobs be created. If people don't have access to the money, whether it's coming from their own pocket, the bank's effective pocket, or some other uh, mar market where the financial markets exist, it's uh, going to limit the success of these 
endeavors and competition is a good thing. What about, you know, how would you get access to capital there? I mean, you say SBA that they're not loaning, but what about credit unions or private buy? Are you seeing any any loans in, in hemp in there? You know, it's it's the most recent three months I've really been focused on this. I've got my own money and time invested into my, I've got a five acre property here in Ohio. I grew up on an acre and I've been on 250 acres and each of those represents its own challenge. But even a small quarter acre hemp crop in Ohio, which is the size that you need to start with, a thousand plant, you're going to need thousands of dollars to be really successful. And so to your point about the credit union in Ohio, um, compared to Michigan, our neighboring state to the north, uh, compared to Indiana, the neighboring state in the west, each of those states, the credit union will potentially really enjoy seeing you and want you to be their customer. Or here in Ohio, there aren't many. They're mm -hmm. effectively treating the hemp customers just like they do the marijuana customers, and they're making the the customer pay compliance fees to do diligence on businesses that are not illicit. So it's really frustrating to want to invest in your own enterprise and have to fight more stigma. Um, so I think it's it's going to, I mean, obviously it's changing. The truth is each state you have your own local flair and it's, it's a real opportunity for that reason. When the federal law changes, it's going to quickly eliminate some of this, but for the moment, it's a real uh, stigmatized thing in many states. Yeah. You know, it was here for a long time. I mean, I, I think that's, that's one of the biggest things that cannabis companies face. Cannabis or hemp are really just access to capital. I mean, it's, it's really, the, I, I would say it's the major limiting factor in, in driving out of business for economy and providing a lot of jobs. It's just that access to capital based purely on, on what you were saying, that the, the federal illegality of, of cannabis plant, but it doesn't really have anything to do with hemp. So it's, uh, it's something that needs to change. And when it does, I think we're going to open up a lot more jobs here. So, well, let's get on yeah. to uh, the the second part here is uh, medical. You know, let's have the same same uh, response and from people as opposed to the hemp in terms of what you're seeing there for sustainability in in your state and the the states around that you're working in or or touching you. Yeah, that's. Uh, I, I believe I believe that's really an opportunity for the states to look at their own environment, phys you know, the, the, the physical environment, the land and the, and the quality of the land and ask themselves what they want to see happen because um, in Ohio, the medical marijuana law changed in the uh, 2015. It's basically been about five years, more or less. And so there's supposed to be 24 operators now. There's less than maybe half or cultivating crop now the other half are still working it out so instead of having literally hundreds of operations there the concentration of the business ownership into a few license holders becomes a real easy mechanism for the state to collect taxes and regulate those businesses but it doesn't necessarily create the best product it doesn't uh, create a lot of competition where if you don't have the most sustainable packaging your competitor is going to easily take that market share. There's a lot of problems with the effective um, limitation on the number of businesses. And so the, our neighbors to the north, Michigan's a much more mature market, uh, much more successful. They have recently changed laws. And, and so it's being a progressive market, I think, has the opportunity to make things better. And yeah. I imagine regulation and writing regulations is not the easiest endeavor, but I do believe that people that are writing the laws need to be held accountable for writing good law. And if that works itself out, I think the opportunity is there for the states to really capitalize on tons of jobs. The jobs should be, you know, $15 an hour minimum wage jobs. There's no reason why we shouldn't be able to pay a living wage in these industries. But if it's not done properly, the, the, unregulated market um, and the uh, you know the reason for illicit activity is going to persist so it, economics class at Ohio State in the 90s my econ, econ 200 professor said literally if you want to end the war on drugs work on the on the 
demand side of the problem, not the supply side. And so there's just a real supply. There's just market forces at work that you don't have to be a real high level intelligent person to look at and understand this is the impact of what what these laws are and what's going to happen. It's it's um, an opportunity that still exists despite a lot of challenges. Now, so why do you think, I mean, this is kind of not, not really a loaded question, but why do you think that the regulators and legislators don't see that kind of basic, uh, you know, statement that you just said about the demand and the supply? Because I think all of us in the industry see that. We know that. We know that, you know, if there isn't a legal way to do it, the black market will thrive. And so, what you know, what why, why doesn't that change faster? I mean, it's a uh, it's a question that we have to deal with every day because we have to fight against the illicit market, and it and it does not do the serv- the industry any uh, you know service to not address it because it's going to grow if things don't change faster. Yeah, yeah, it's a really interesting question, and if you want to sit around and um, debate for a while, I think it'll be a lively debate. But I, I believe if you were to look at the at the agriculture, food industry at large. I mean, the cannabis plant's a little bit unique because it's a, a food and a, and a medicine. And so in Michigan, you're able to grow your own crop, uh, 12 plants. And so the, 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 the amount of sales actually diminished at the end of the year, I suspect, because a lot of people had their own, their own crop coming off. So huh. in a lot of ways, if they're, if it's pay to play, which is basically the way that it is in Ohio, you have to be a million, you literally have to have millions of dollars yeah. uh, to operate that entity. So not to say that there is fraud and um, um, bribery in the states, but the truth is the state law changes. And then a lot of states have given local authority to townships and municipalities to say whether or not it's effectively cool and where you want to look and see you'll see places where people i'm sure are being paid to be okay so it it's a lot of this um basically friction in the market is because the laws aren't um effectively the overbearing nature of the laws and the the effort to try to constrain the supply and is is become part of the problem. The black market, if you want to call it that, isn't going to go away until uh, some of these barriers are, are taken out of the out of the system and some of the uh, I, you know call them inefficiencies, call them friction, whatever you want to call it. It's just it's not a free market for sure. And you know people still buy tomatoes at the grocery store. Everybody doesn't grow their own tomatoes. So at some point down the road when the stigma is taken off the plant and the states are effectively figuring out how to make their budgets balance, I believe you're, you're going to see it, uh, you know, 40, 50 uh, cents on the dollar tax for a product is not really a workable system. So I think it has to be, um, it just has to work itself out. It's still in its infancy. Do you, do you think it is stigma that that's pri- the primary reason that it's just going to take time? I know in my in my proverbial neck of the woods, being from the Midwest um, and having a partner and other relationships in the South, and knowing more about the Bible Belt now than I did when I was a teenager. You know, the war on drugs started when I was a teenager, so it's basically still persisting today. And so I do think the stigma is real. Uh, I've had many conversations with bankers that have effectively told me it's a crime. And I've had to educate them about what I'm doing. And so, you know, the alcohol and the tobacco industry, uh, uh, um, you know, the packaging and the tobacco and the alcohol industry, there's no child proof requirement there. So I, yeah. I just had this point made to me yesterday that that uh, you can't recycle the pharmaceutical packaging because it's possible that the child proof would wear out. So, you know, the cost benefit of the of the matter needs to be part of the of the decision making and if it's not i think that's becomes part of the reason why the problems aren't solved yeah it's a it's a very complex issue and i don't think that it needs to be complex i mean we're still going through this probably faster than 
you know, slower than we want, but it is relatively quick in terms of an industry maturing. But there are a lot of challenges, especially as we've seen over the past year with the, you know, divisions within the country, just about opinions. And so you imagine every jurisdiction, every city, every state, you know, every regulator, every commissioner, they all have a different opinion about what, what cannabis is and the legality of it. So, you know, one, it, it may be the stigma and two, it may just take time for people who are, you know, younger growing into those positions that don't have that stigma from the 50s on up, you know, who are our age to really just start to make the laws. So interesting time that we're in. So absolutely, absolutely. Well, I'm going to get into uh, adult use. Uh, and really, so the third third part of the question here is how is adult use and how do you see that with sustainability uh, going on where you are in, in your surrounding states? I, it's, it's really interesting to me when you talk about the surrounding states and it really emphasizes how different we are, as I just said, as a country state to state. Yeah, that's that's the truth. And I attended the hemp conference in 2019 in February, and, and there was a venture capitalist that was speaking. And he, I asked the question about the state by state regulations, if it made it a, a better opportunity or, or it created challenges that the venture capital community wouldn't want to be a part of. And he absolutely said that state by state, the way this rolls out, it delays the um, competitiveness. And so there is an opportunity to get in front of the other folks that are trying to make make their way in the market. And so I, I believe that for me in the in the Midwest, like I've said, you know, Michigan is a has always been a state that I've personally traveled to. I traveled uh, fortunate to travel when I was younger at an aunt in Arizona and I, I saw almost every state in the United States before I was 18 and it's become part of who I am. And and so I believe the tourism aspect of the adult use cannabis industry you know, Denver is an awesome city, and uh, I think other cities that have a lot of travel will benefit from opening up those markets. And and if you think about Airbnb, how successful that is, I, I just think that if we weren't so worried about the stigma, I think you could easily look at the business opportunities, the, the opportunity to, to open up job growth, to have, have much more competition. And it's nice to be vertically integrated so that you can control all of those aspects of the supply chain. But if, if you look at other industries and you apply the concepts to the cannabis industry, in my opinion, we're, coming, we're, we're entering an era where craft and specialty operators have the opportunity to step in there um, you know, and be a real world-class business doing just one small piece of a super huge industry so you know if the tides truly are all rising right now we should all agree that there's plenty of opportunity work to educate one another work to learn from other operators and effectively the you know the the big industries get a a lot of um you know feedback mischaracterization potentially but they're going to do what they're going to do a third of the market's going to be owned by the small operators for the next 10 years it's not going to be dominated for a while so it's it's just a huge opportunity that we can all uh, take advantage of and i do believe that adult use markets you know if oregon was able to ship its product to illinois right now um, a lot of people go to the windy city there's a lot of um, reason why that makes sense and it would um, invigorate a lot of communities that need the need the the economic activity in the tax base do you do you see kind of like New York is talking about, you know, joining together up in in the Northeast that there there would be packs around your area, just like there are water packs, you know, states band together. Do you you know if you, if everyone has the same laws next to one another, would that be a possibility that you see in the future coming up? I absolutely think it makes sense. The concentration of population on the eastern seaboard is a real factor for a lot of reasons, a lot of industries. And where I'm at in Columbus, they raised 14 bridges going down to Virginia over a 10-year period to be this intermodal hub and bring product in with planes, trains, and automobiles, basically. And so um, we can reach 80, we can reach 65% of the United States population from where I am. Um, and that's a, that's a really uh, important development force. But the Northeast, New York, New Jersey, 
you know, eastern half of Pennsylvania, those markets, they there's, you know, you do need land. You can't grow all the crop in a building. There are technologies and greenhouse structures that are continue to become more efficient. And so I do believe that you're going to see more and more sustainable structures being built. But in Michigan, you know, it's you can grow outdoors. And so why would you grow indoors if you can grow outdoors? It's um, electric bills a real thing. So I, I just think that if you stop and ask yourself, you know, what makes sense? A lot of this is farming. A lot of this is just uh, horticulture. We've been selecting plants for 10,000 years and you know, biotechnology and the new decision-making tools with artificial intelligence. It's still basically growing plants for food and medicine. And, and now we're fortunate to be able to do it in a real accelerated manner. The, um, you know, the difference between adult use and medical, do you see one of them absorbing the other at any time? Or will there yeah. always be a difference? Even though it's the same plant, will there be a difference in categorization? You know, I think there's always a need to have a higher potency product for a medical patient. And so I believe at a higher concentration, you have the potential to have a product that could potentially cause, you know, some some impacts to younger people. And I do think adult use is the right way to characterize it because it, the truth is, you don't we don't need a bunch of teenagers uh, smoking pot. I mean, it's not good right. for the developing brain. And so I think the medical marijuana market exists because the need to treat it as a medicine is real. It does need to be regulated at a high, it needs to be tested and validated at a real high level so that cancer patients, folks that have compromised immune system aren't getting some of the products. And so um, I do think that it makes sense to keep it separate. And I also think you're going to see insurance uh, basically covering that product. And that's another reason, strong reason to keep the two separated. Hmm. That's an interesting point. Well, great, Tim. You know, this has been really good information. I, I appreciate it. I appreciate your perspective and really to see what the what the world is like on the other side of the country, at least from from Colorado here. How can people get a hold of you uh, to talk more or what's your website? Yeah, I appreciate that. And um, we call ourselves the heart of it all here in Ohio. I guess that's the state motto. So it's um, we're not uh, Eastern Seaboard folks, but in the Midwest, it's nice to um, nice to be connected. And um, our you know Colorado's where it all started, effectively in some ways. But you can reach me on a website www.biocultureGroupLLC.com. My email address Tim at BiocultureGroupLLC.com, and my cell phone number six one four three zero four thirteen forty. I always enjoy a good chat. Uh, like to tell stories and uh, potentially um, get along that way, if you will. But um, appreciate the opportunity, Ben, and look forward to um, the things coming at us in the new year. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm excited too, and I apologize about my my video here. Tell me what what are you excited about this next year in terms of projects that you're working on? Yeah, it's uh, going to be a second year cr uh, crop in Ohio for me. So I've got some changes to my environment here. I'm looking to grow in indoors or under some cover. Last year, I grew an outdoor crop, 5,000 plants, all seeds. So I'll be working from some cuttings this year and doing some more propagation, working on some breeding projects and, and looking to really leverage the genetics that I've had fortunate, uh, fortunate to get access to. And so I'm just looking to produce a higher quality crop one year at a time. Great. Sounds good. Well, thanks. Good luck. And next time we talk, I'll, I'll try to be here in person. So enjoy your day. Thanks a lot, Tim. I appreciate it. Take care. Thank you kindly.